They ran most of the way heading towards the white part of the river, where trees grouped themselves in families darkening the earth below. They passed some boys swimming and clowning in the water, shrouding their words in laughter. They ran in the sunlight, creating their own breeze, which pressed their dresses into their damp skin, reaching a kind of square of four-leaf rock trees, which promised cooling. They flung themselves into the four corner shade to taste their lips sweat and contemplate the wildness that had come upon them so suddenly. They lay in the grass, their foreheads almost touching, their bodies stretched away from each other at 180 degree angle. Suga's head rested on her arm, an undone braid coiled around her wrist. Nell leaned on her elbows and worried long blades of grass with her fingers. Underneath their dresses, flesh tightened and shivered in the high coolness, their small breasts just now beginning to create some pleasant discomfort when they were lying on their stomachs. Sula lifted her head and joined Nell in the grass play. In concert, without ever meeting each other's eyes, they stroked the plates up and down, up and down. Nell found a thick twig and with her thumbnail pulled away it barks until it was stripped to a smooth, creamy innocence. Sula looked about and found one too. When both twigs were undressed, Nell moved easily to the next stage and began tearing up rooted grass to make a bare spot of earth. When a generous clearing was made, Sula traced intricate patterns in it with her twig. At first, Nell was content to do the same. But soon she grew impatient and poked her twig rhythmically and intensely into the earth, making a small neat hole that grew deeper and wider with the least manipulation of her twig. Sula copied her, and soon each had a hole the size of a cup. Nell began a more strenuous digging and, rising to her knee, was careful to scoop out the dirt as she made her hole deeper. Together they worked until the two holes were one of the same. When the depression was the size of a small dishpan, Nell's twig broke. With a gesture of disgust, she threw the pieces into the hole they had made. Sula threw hers in two. Nell saw a bottle cap and tossed it in as well. Each then looked around for more debris to throw into the hole. Paper, bits of glass, butts of cigarettes, until all the small, defiling things they could find were collected there. Carefully, they replaced the soil and covered the entire grave with uprooted grass. Neither one had spoken a word. They stood up, stretched, then gazed with the swift, dull water as an unspeakable restlessness and agitation held them. At the same instant, each girl heard footsteps in the grass. A little boy in two big knickers was coming up from the lower bank of the river. He stopped when he saw them and picked his nose. Your mama told you stop eating snot, chicken! Nell hollered at him through cupped hands. He said, still picking. Uh, you better, you come here and you say that to me. Ah, uh, leave him alone, Nell. Come here, chicken. Let me show you something. No. What, you scared we gonna take your bugger away? I said leave him alone. Anyway, look, I'm gonna help climb trees. Chicken looked at the trees Lou was pointing to. A big double beach with low branches and lots of fence were sitting. He moved slowly toward her. Still picking his nose, his eyes wide, he came to where they were standing. Still took him by the hand and coaxed him along. When they reached the base of the beach, she lifted him to the first branch, saying, Go on, go on, I got you. She followed the boy, steadying him when he needed it with her hand and a reassuring voice. When they were as high as they could go, Sula pointed to the far side of the river. See? Bet you never saw that, did you? Uh -uh. Ooh, look down there. They both leaned in a little and peered through the leaves at Nell standing below, squinting up at them. From their height, she looked small and foreshortened. Chicken little laughed. <laughs> Y'all better, y'all better get yourselves down here before you break your necks. Nell hollered. I ain't never going down. Boy hollered back. Yeah, we better go now, too. Oh, don't leave. Sula slowed his leg gently. Okay, I'm leaving. She started on. Wait. He screamed. Sula stopped and together they slowly worked their way down. Chicken was still elated. I was way up there, wasn't I? Wasn't I? I'm gonna tell my brother. Sula and Nell began to mimic him. I'm gonna tell, tell my brother. I'm gonna tell my brother. Sula picked him up by his hands and swung him <laughs> outward, then around and around. His knickers ballooned and his shrieks of fright and joy startled the birds and the black grasshoppers. When he slipped from her hands and sailed away out of the water, they could still hear his bubbly laughter. The water darkened and closed quickly over the place where Chicken Little sank. The pressure of his hard and tight little fingers was still in Sula's palms as she stood looking at the closed place in the water. They expected him to come back up, laughing. Both girls stood at the water. Nell spoke first. I think someone's A figure appeared briefly on the opposite shore. The only house over there was Shadrach's. Sula glanced at Nell, tear widened her nostrils. Had he seen? The water was so peaceful now. There was nothing but the baking sun and something newly missing. Sula cupped her face for an instant then turned and ran up to the little plank bridge that crossed over to Shadrach's house. There was no path. 
It was as though neither Shadrach nor anyone else ever came this way. Renny was swift and determined, but when she was close to the three little steps that led to his porch, fear crawled into her stomach, and only the something newly missing back there in the river made it possible for her to walk up the three steps and knock at the door. No one answered. She started back, but thought again of the peace of the river. Shadrach would be inside, just behind the door, ready to pounce on her. Still, she could not go back. Ever so gently, she pushed the door with the tips of her fingers and heard only the hinges weep. And then she was inside, alone. The neatness, the order startled her, but more surprising was her restfulness. Everything was so tiny, so common, so unthreatening. Perhaps this is not the house of the Shad. The Shad who walked about with his penis out, who peed in front of the ladies and girl children, the only black who could curse white people and get away with it, who drank in the road from the mouth of the bottle, who shouted and shook the streets. This cottage? The sweet old cottage? With its made-up bed, with its rag rug and wooden table, Sula stood in the middle of the little room, and in her wonder forgot what she had come for until a sound at the door made her jump. He was there in the doorway, looking at her. She had not heard his coming, and now he was looking at her. More in embarrassment than terror, she averted her glance. When she called up enough courage to look back at him, she saw his hand resting upon the door frame. His fingers barely touched in the wood were arranged in a graceful arc. Relieved and encouraged, no one with hands like that, no one with fingers that curved around wood so tenderly could kill her. She walked past him out of the door, feeling his gaze turning, turning with her. At the edge of the porch, gathering the wisps of courage that were fast leaving her, she turned once more to look at him, to ask him, had he? He was smiling a great smile, heavy with lust in time to come. He nodded his head as though answering her question, and said in a pleasant conversational tone, a tone of cool butter. Oh. Sula fled down the steps and shot through the greenness and baking sun back to Nell in the dark, closed place of the water. There she collapsed in tears. No quieted her. Don't. Don't. You didn't need it. It wasn't your fault. Did you, did you see it? Did you see us? Come on. You got your belt, right? Sula shook her head as she searched her waist for the belt. Finally, she stood up and allowed Nell to lead her away. So the battery died. Okay. Hello. Always. What? So it covered her mouth as they walked down the hill. Always. He'd answered a question she had not asked, and its promise lifted her feet. Loving in the moonlight, having a wonderful time.